On today's podcast, we discuss the 2022 Cool Clinic, which is coming up May 19th through the 21st. You go to cool2022.coachesclinic.com or check the show note for the links to be able to access that. I'm going to talk with Coach Bob Wiley about some of the past Cool Clinics, his insight into the game, and I think you're going to find that he's just a wealth of knowledge on football and on coaching, and there's certainly a lot of takeaways here in today's podcast. Coach Wiley, it's great to have you back on the podcast to talk about this year's Cool Clinic. Oh, it's great to be back. I really, really enjoy, really passionate about what we give back to the game. We've been doing this now. This is our, actually it's our 40th year since 1982 or 1983, somewhere back there. You know, we started this in, in Jimmy's office back in the, in the Bengals. And I say we, I say Jimmy invited six of us for, to come over and talk football in his office. And uh, uh, there, there was Paul Alexander, there was myself, there was a guy named Freddie Mariani, there was Jake Hallam, God rest his soul. All right, and there was a sixth guy, and nobody we can remember who the sixth guy was. Okay. And, and then it's just grown uh, from year to year, and it, ke- it kept getting bigger and bigger. And then Jimmy was having it in the, in the team room the team meeting room at the Bengal office in old spinny field and, and, and Mike Brown and the, and the family were thinking, thought Jimmy was giving away all the Bengal secrets. So we moved it over into the old quarry and hotel in Cincinnati, you know what I mean? And it, it's, and, and then the quarry changed to the four point Sheraton and then changed to the millennium. And now they've actually knocked the millennium down. It doesn't even exist anymore. You know what I mean? So next year when we do this, we're gonna we're gonna bring it back virtually, and we're gonna have it in person in Cincinnati again. So it'll be run both ways, okay? But uh, it, it, and we believe the coaches that speak at it that we give back to the profession that's been so good to us. And it's amazing that when I call the guys, right, uh, the college guys, they're really, you know, I call the college guys. You know, Russia should they, they they call me right back and they want to be on it, right? They they don't they look forward to, yeah, you because know, they don't know who I'm going to call every year to to come on the, the thing. Like this year, we got that young coach Cody Kennedy, uh, Sam Pittman, who I worked with at Cincinnati, and he's the head coach at Arkansas now. Right? He called me. He says, "Hey," he says, he says "Wilds," he says, "I got a a young line coach here. He'd be really good for the clinic." So Sam's recommending a guy to me. I think he's going to be really good offensive line coach. So I said, okay, I'll put him on. So we put him on the clinic. So and it's really fun putting it together. But over the years, I think what we've done, and I can't remember the exact number. I'm kind of guessing at this one. I want to say last time I looked at all the registrations, it's been over 12,000 coaches that we have, I think we've helped become better. You know what I mean? And that's the guys that just attended the clinic. Okay. That's guys that have bought the DVDs or been on coaches too, or bet, you know what I'm saying? That's just the guys that have been at it. I, I like to think that we have helped the game as offensive line coaches a great deal. Coach, before we get going and talking about this year's Cool Clinic and some of the things that have happened in the past Cool Clinic, what insight do you have into coaching this game that a coach of any position could benefit from? If you're going to coach this sport, okay, then then you better work at it. You better have a path that every day that you want to get better as a coach, okay, and you want to find a way to get better as a coach, whether it's a new way of teaching, a different way to present something, okay, whatever that is, and you have to make the chemistry that, that, that you create between you and your players is more important than any of the X's and the O's. You know, people, and we are all guilty of it, okay, even myself as a younger coach, okay, we're chasing the X's and O's, okay, we're chasing the, the miracle play, the miracle first step, we're chasing the, the scheme. You know, whether it's a protection scheme or a run blocking scheme, before you do any of that, that you have to have some type of rapport with your players. Players really don't care 
how much you know players care how much you care about them. Now, it may be different at some of the younger ages, but you still have to uh, show uh, the caring in, in, in well, what's the word I'm looking for, the, for, uh, for the younger players, okay, that concerned about them, okay, as people first, and, and then the rest of the stuff fits in. If you don't set that first, I think you have a problem. I think you run into uh, where you're just using them as players, and then once they've done, then you can't get any more out of them. You get rid of them. I I can't coach like that myself. You know what I mean? I try to create a rapport with the players, really uh, show them that I, I really care about them first, and then all the other stuff comes behind it. Really, the last thing that I do, and I don't even really care what level it's on, the last thing I do is the X's and the O's. I try to establish okay, what the the room that you're in, what this is going to be like, guys. And it's going to be like this for the season. And it's going to be like this year-round, not just for the season. I try to establish that you guys can come to me anytime. You can call me anytime. You can text me anytime. You can email me. Okay, it doesn't matter. I will get back to you. The other thing, if I don't, if sometimes they'll ask you a question and you don't have the answer. Well, you can't be afraid to tell them that you don't have the answer. But don't try to BS them. Don't do that. Just tell them, hey, look, guys, I don't have the answer. I'm going to go see the coordinator or the head coach or wherever I need to go to get the answer. But you'll have the answer before you step onto the field for practice or for walkthrough. So guys try to BS them and make up something, and it may not even it may not be right. Don't even, don't ever tell a player or make up something that's not right for a player, and then have them go on the field thinking that this is the right thing to do. That that's really a bad mistake. That's really bad teaching. I think too many young coaches make that mistake that you have to be the know-it-all and it's far from that. Even as a young teacher, right? When I was going through the college and learning how to be a teacher, you know, I remember professors saying, you know, it's it's okay sometimes to not know the answer that just tell them you'll get back with them. That's a good question. You'll get back with them. You can't be afraid to do that. And I think it goes back to, you know, you're, you're being honest with them and you're showing them that you care. You care enough to not BS them on the answer. Right, exactly. You you care enough about them that you're going to go and you're going to go find the answer and it's going to be the right answer for what what we intend to do at this point in time. You know, so I think you have to approach the game that way. I I really do. You know, and a lot of guys like to yell and scream. I remember when I was a young coach, you'd be yelling and screaming. I was... There's places I think where you have to do that, but I think the more, it's more of a teaching. I, I always remember I had the pleasure of listening and being around Coach Brown when I early, early in my career. Okay, when I used to go help Jimmy uh, McNally, and you know, he said, "Teach them, don't tell them. Teach them. Okay, you don't have to yell at them all the time. Teach them. Okay, just teach them. They'll get it." Now, after a while, if you say the same thing to the kid, you know, 47 times and he's still doing a wrong game, sometimes the discussion gets a little heated, you know, but that's part of the game. I think the toughest thing to keep, they have to know that when you get on their case, when you get on them, when you start to get a little boisterous with them, that you're, you're not mad at them, okay, for who they are. You're mad at them for what they did. And it's completely different. And they have to learn to separate the two. Okay? And, and it's tough for players, even the older players. But the younger guys, it's really, they think you're mad at them personally. You think you're taking it out on them as a person, and you're not. You know, if you're supposed to go block the linebacker, and then you block the nose guard if you're a guard or right guard, and then you go block the nose guard instead of the linebacker, and I get on your case, well, I'm not mad at you for who you are. 
I'm not mad at Keith Grabowski. I'm mad at what you did. That's what I'm upset about. And you have to make the player understand between the two before you, that before you even start. That's part of the room. That's part of the makeup of the room. That's part of showing them that you care. Hey, I'm mad at what you did. I'm not mad at I love all you guys. I love all you guys in this room. But sometimes you're going to do things that I don't like, and I'm going to get on your case. Not that it's you. It's what you did. I think a lot of young coaches don't understand that. They don't know how to approach the kid that way. They get on the kid's case, and they and, and then they never go back to the kid. Sometimes you, you know, all players are different. Some, some you can do that with, okay, and they understand it. Some you have to feed them sugar, you know, to get them to, to understand what you're trying to do. So there's all different ways you have to, as a coach, right? You have to have all different ways in your bag of trucks to get it done. Does that make sense? Yeah, something you bring up there too. And I believe I read something maybe in Joe Paterno's book that, that he was talking about. For some reason, I, I feel like it was attributed to Joe Paterno, but the idea... You know, you mentioned, you know, you tell the guy 47 times and, you know, we've got a different issue. But in thinking in how you approach that situation, when you run into, man, I've told this guy again and again and again, at, at what point before you hit that, you know, you might hit the frustration anyway and, and elevate your voice. Do you look at what are the methods I'm using? Where, where am I missing, you know, and reflecting on that process as a coach and a teacher that maybe there's a different way to connect with him. Yeah. What am I doing wrong that I can't get through to this kid? You know what I mean? I'm big into the unconscious competence, the four stages of learning a new skill. You know, everybody on the planet learns the same way, all those things. But within there, you know, is the kid an audio learner? You know, is he a visual learner? You know, where he can just see it. I have to, I need to show it to him on film. You know, is he a tactical learner? where he needs to touch it. He, does he, do I need to get him up on the board and have him draw it? Make sure he understands it and he draws it and he can repeat it back to me. Do I have to take him out and put the bags on the ground and have him walk through the different looks? So, you know, some guys you have to do that with them. You know what I mean? There's, there's all ways to approach them. So if you exhausted all your means of presentation and teaching, you know, that's when kind of you hit the panic button. You know, I, I shouldn't say panic button, but that's when you, you kind of raise your voice, as you said earlier. Right? I've exhausted all means. I, you, know, you sit down, and you, you sit them next to you, open a playbook, you, you've got the video, you've got the picture in the playbook, you, you have them write it down on the pad, and you sit and write next to him to make sure he's got it, right? And then all of a sudden, you get in the practice and he blocks the nose guard again. He started a linebacker. You know, it's not, he's missing here. That's where frustration sets in. Oh. Let's, let's take this to the cool clinic. You've had just some incredible guys over the years, the best offensive line coaches in the history of the game, right, have come through the cool clinic virtually these last two years. But at the hotel in Cincinnati, all the previous years, looking at those guys and really as you saw like wow this guy is an incredible teacher who are some guys that pop into your mind as just some of the best teachers in the game and what made them like that what were the things that maybe you were even able to pick up from those guys and implement well well jimmy jimmy mcnally i gotta go back to jim i've known jim since 1975 Okay, I was a young I was a junior high, high school football coach. Going back to 1975, he was at Boston College as the, the offensive line coach. And I went to the clinic, the Boston College Spring Clinic, and I listened to him talk. And, and I said, this guy's pretty sharp. And I'm, I'm trying to get these plays that my high school coach, we ran this offense because he came from the Chicago Bears, and I'm trying to, put these plays to rules and I have no idea how to do it. None. And I went up to Jimmy after he got done speaking and I said, coach, could you help me? I'm trying to get these plays done, you know, put together, you know, with some rules so I can give it to the players. Cause our high school coach never did that. 
he just told us who to block. You block that guy, you block that guy, and this guy that play. You know what I mean? I'd say, there's got to be a better way to do this. So Jimmy said, yeah. He said, but I can't do it now. Come back, you know, like next Friday or something. So I went back next Friday and Jimmy he sat down and he was so patient with me and took it away and explained to me exactly, you know, because back then the rules were a little different. It was like in, on, out, linebacker, you know, uh, in, down, out, on, out, outside. You know, those were the type of rules that they did back then. And so he took every play that I had and went with me. We spent the whole day together and put it all to rules, the runs and the protections. And well, I really learned a lot and how he taught me. You know, he was up on the board. He had me he had me write it down on my notes. He I mean it was a he drew a chop for me and listed the you know, the left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle. Okay, we had it all charted out. It was amazing the time that he spent with me teaching me how to do this. And then later on, as I progressed in my career, I ended up at Brown University. You know, Jimmy went from Boston College to Wake Forest, and he went to the Bengals. And he's at the Bengals, and, and I get a phone call, and, and it's Jim. And he says, hey, he said, listen, as far as Greg just gave me this playbook, listen to these plays, right? It's 27 A O'Connor, you know, 46 HB, 39 UO smash, 48 MUO. It was the same plays, right, that I had brought to him way back when I was a young coach, right? And, he, and I told I said, that's the stuff that come from the Chicago Bears. I said, so Vince Lombardi and George Howard, you know what I mean? They may have stole from each other. And that offense was going around back in the 1940s. You know, 40, I think the 1946 World Champion, Chicago Bears, my, my high school football coach played for those guys. So, I mean, I just remember Jimmy spending time, having the patience, that's a good word, having the patience to sit down and do that for me, that that showed exceptional way of teaching to me. I learned stuff from Alex Gibbs. Alex Gibbs was, God rest his soul, right? Uh, Alex Gibbs was very successful because Alex Gibbs did it all himself. It didn't matter what the running back coach, quarterback coach, tight end coach. Uh, Alex Gibbs did the whole run game. He put the run game in, and he coached all the positions the way he wanted it coached, and it was one voice, and everybody did it the way Alex wanted it done. That's where his success came in, because he had the ability to do that, right? Coach everybody. And so he could get it the way he wanted it done. He didn't have to rely on the running back coach, because he may be saying it different. He didn't have to rely on the tight end coach because the tight end coach may be saying it different. The same thing with the quarterback coach. Alex did it. And as you watch Alex's career, I mean, they had some great running football teams at the Denver Broncos, or really, wherever he showed up to put the, the, the that stretch play in, whether he was in Houston, Atlanta, uh, Denver, it worked. It worked for them. And so... I learned that if you can be, if you can have the ability to do that, if your head coach lets you, hey, he's going to run the offensive running game. He's got it, All right? You guys just listen to Alex. That was helpful in, in, you know, how good can you be? Well, if it's your show, right, and you can do it all by yourself, and then the other guys kind of support you, that's a way to get it done where it's from one voice. I think that's very helpful. Dan Radakovich, God rest his soul, he's at the, he spoke at the clinic. Dan had a special way of teaching his players. He taught them, but he also kind of, uh, when they did it wrong, had a little kind of a, a insinuating comment that he would make to them, okay? He'd have his own style. You know, sometimes they'd be doing it wrong and he'd get upset with them. You know, and he'd go sit in the stands. he said, say, okay. You guys think you're so smart, do it yourself. So I'm going to go sit in the stands, right? So he go up and he just sit in the stands. And, and then eventually he'd come back out of the stands after the players figured they couldn't figure it out by themselves. They needed him. 
So there's, there's a lot of different ways that guys do it. Uh, Howard Mudd, I was, uh, God rest his soul, Howard w- was really, really good to me, okay, over the years. And, you know, Howard never changed, you know, from for 40 years. Howard did the same things over and over and over again. But when you talk to Howard, honest to God, it was like talking to a college professor. It really was. His knowledge of the game, the knowledge of the techniques, and the knowledge of how the body works and how he wanted to get it done was truly amazing. So everybody has a different way of, of approaching the game, and it really doesn't matter which one that you use. It's how you can get it. And you young guys, write this down. It's how you can get it from the chalkboard to the grass. Right? You've got to be able to get it from the chalkboard and get it done on the field. That's what's important. How you do that, as long as you can get that done, because the end product is how your play is played, that's what counts. Right? That's what counts. How you get them to play. Everybody has different ways of getting their players to play. But the end result is what matters. If they're playing and they're blocking their guys, however you got that done, that's all that matters. I don't know what else to tell, to tell them about that, but that, that's what's important. The end result all right, is your guy blocks the guy that winds up in front of him, either in one or in the pass game. And they don't really care what position it is either. You know, the receivers are they running the right routes at the right depth and they're making the right breaks. You know, the one in the right holes. It doesn't matter what position it is. Can you get it from the chalkboard to the grass? That's what's important. I know you've had the opportunity to coach some incredible offensive linemen over the years. And last uh, cool clinic we had Joe Thomas come on and, and he talked about all the things he did and was so impressed with his approach to the game. Who are some of the other guys that, you know, when you're looking – back on it the guys you've coached that you know this is why he was so good this is the approach that he took this is what made him uh, such a good offensive lineman and able to sustain success over the years i've been around anthony munoz for, for years um, owen Cruz with the chicago bears he was another one jc triller with the and joe petonio those guys uh well jc was just with cleveland and joe's still there some of the really good players, Max Montoya, okay, that was with the Bengals years ago in Seattle, who else? Uh, Bruce Kozurski, guys. I'm, I'm trying to give you guys that I was at the pinnacle of their careers. Why were they so good for so many years? They all had one thing in common. When when they come in, okay, the passion they had for the game, they had something a little different in their makeup than the other guys had. They would come in and they would take meticulous notes, like Owen Cruz's notebook. You could publish it. Same thing with Joe Thomas. They take the same notes the first year you had them, or as they did, right? If you had them for 10 years, 10 years later, in the very first meeting you had with them, they'd still be taking notes. And, and, and the preparation they put in to prepare for a game, right, is above the rest of the guys. It was just incredible, the passion and the details that they, they didn't overlook anything, okay? And I think all those type of players have that. And then you get the other guys that are just kind of guys, right? They just kind of do what they think they're supposed to do to try to get by for the day. Those guys are only going to be average players and, and probably some of them are going to be below average. Okay, and those guys are probably going to get you fired. The elite ones, the great ones that play the game, they go a step beyond. They have something in their makeup that makes them do that, makes them not want to fail, makes them want to be the best right at what they do, right? Makes them, uh, when they see themselves on film, makes them, when somebody else watches them on film, say, wow, look at that. Look at the way he does that. That's really good. That comes from the individual players make up the passion and the love that he has for the game. You know, if some guys are playing the game for the money, they're not going to lie. 
Some guys are going to play the game, okay, because they love the passion of the game. And if you didn't pay them, they'd still play. Those are the guys that are usually around for a long time. I know in seeing the, the cool clinic over the years that you know, innovation happens there too. You guys share some new ideas. Well, Howard was always, you know, the way he approached the game was innovative to me. And Paul Alexander is another one. And, 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 and Jimmy, those are two guys that always came up with something that was a little bit different, okay, that you could take with you and try and see if it worked for you. Sometimes stuff works for other guys because the way they teach it and the way they present it, and, some, and it doesn't work for other guys, even though they try to teach it because they don't know enough about it. They don't do enough research. You know, uh, Punch is another one. God rest Punch is so kind. These guys have all passed on me now, right? You know, Jimmy Punch played at 260 pounds as a right tackle in the National Football League for years. Okay, and he went, how, how did he do that? Well, it was his ability to punch. Okay, so Jimmy gets with Punch, okay, and he brings Punch in. And studies touch, learns from touch, learns how to do that from touch. And that's how touch played with it. Touch went it from a, a martial arts guy, I think the guy's name, he called him Saj. And he developed his way of playing. So you learn the players, then Jimmy started to teach that at the clinics. And he brought touch in to teach it. And so that was a, an innovative thing. Paul Alexander, he's another one. He's kind of like Howard and the way he presents things and the way he, he uh, takes, you know, different angles and different ways and fulcrums and different things that he uses to, to explain the, the ability to block somebody. His techniques are a little different than what most guys may be using, but they work for Paul. He makes you better, right? So there's, there's guys that have, uh, uh, who else is, uh, uh, I'll give you one. Okay, Dan, I already mentioned Dan Radakovich. Sometimes in pass protection, Dan would move his backside foot first. You know, when you go kick, slide, kick, or kick, back, kick. Well, Dan, at some points in time, he'd have the players move his inside foot first. The, the foot away from where he was going, he moved that foot first, okay? Well, he believed that that got you there faster. That'll get you there faster. If you move your inside foot first, you may be a little vulnerable to the inside move. Okay, but if the guy never comes inside, don't worry about it. All right? So little things like that, little innovative things like that. Jerry Wampler, we would kick. He's the first guy that I heard, okay, that we got it from Jimmy to visit with Jerry. I think Jerry might have been at Detroit at the time. But, but when you kick and the guy goes inside, if you get fully stretched with the kick step, you replaced it. You put it back where you first started. So you kick, bring it back, and then you follow that. That was really innovative. I mean, for a guy to think about, hey, kick the guy's crossing my face. If I move my inside leg first, I'm going to open up my inside hip. And now I'm not going to have to be able to stop this guy from going across my face. Or I'm not going to be able to redirect him. He came up with, hey, just take the outside foot after you kick. If you've got fully stretched, bring it back to its normal position and then move your inside foot. Those are little details. There's another one. Your outside hand and pass protection. It, it always changes, but and now some of the biggest things is your outside hand is your eye hand. That's your high hand. Okay? And your inside low hand is your low hand. So you've got a high hand and you've got a low hand. That was a little different than when we first started. You know, everybody, when we first started, the hands were up and the hands were out. And then they were all knocking them down. Then we learned to keep our hands low, okay, so they can't knock them down, right? Then it was one year we had the inside hand. When you set, you take the inside hand, you grab the guy's inside pad, the tip of his inside shoulder pad, and you grab him, okay? So you don't want to ever get beat inside, so you just grab him from the inside pad. Okay, now that's changed the outside hand. Years ago, Jim Hannaford and Tom Lavat, they 
at a three technique, they, they called it an up kick. Right? So instead of kick and cover the guy up, they would take their outside foot and actually up kick it. So now their inside leg is back. So they'd up kick it and stab them with the outside hand. And now if the guy goes inside, his inside leg is back. So he can move faster inside if the guy makes the inside move on him. God, that's, you know, innovative thinking. It's completely opposite of what we were teaching. Kick, cover the guy up, you know, keep your inside foot posted. Right now it all starts to change again. So these guys speaking at the clinic, you know, presented all these little different things that you as a coach have to say, hey, I can take this. This works for me. So all those little things that you pick up from the clinic, and then you have to research it and learn all the nuances about it so you can be able to teach it to your players so they understand it and get it done. You know, I talk to different guys, uh, you know, some players will take their big toe in their stance, okay, and they'll curl their big toe up so they can, you know, so they're going to say, hey, if I'm going to kick, I'm going to take this and I'm going to move my inside foot, but I'm going to drag that toe. It's more of a kick drag. Does that work? You have to understand what you're trying to do and get it to the player and have the player. You know, I remember years ago, Keith, came up with the left-handed stance. Remember, everything used to be a right-handed stance. Everybody's in a right-handed stance. Then we were sitting down talking about putting the left-side guys in a left-handed stance. So guys would he say, hey, no, nah, that, that doesn't feel comfortable. Nah, see, that doesn't feel comfortable, right? It doesn't matter if it feels uncomfortable to me or to you as a coach. Does it feel uncomfortable to the player? He's going to play. Mm-hmm. That's what matters. Let him try it and let him decide, hey, yeah, this feels pretty good. I like this. Or, no, nah, I really don't. I'd rather do it the other way. So the other way is better for me. You got to be able to adjust with the player. You know, I, I see so many guys, young coaches, they got the books and, and, and they re know books that they have out there about blocking and stuff. Can they get their guy to do it? That's all that matters, really. Can they get their guy? You know, and sometimes they, you know, like I said, they read the book and it doesn't feel comfortable for them. Let the player decide if it's comfortable for him because he has play the game. Well, Coach, we have another incredible lineup for the 2022 Cool Clinic. Uh, Been happening now for 46 years. And when we were talking about, okay, how can we make this better? You came up with some great ideas here. And so in addition to having Super Bowl champion Kevin Carberry, national champion Matt Luke, and CFL Grey Cup champion Marty Costello. We've added some sessions that provide some different perspective to uh, the typical things that you do get at the Cool Clinic. You're still going to have all that, but one of those uh, starts with NFL alumni head coach, guy everybody knows, John Gruden, talking about what I look for when hiring an offensive line coach. I know you had the opportunity to talk with Coach Gruden and, and set this up. How excited is he to be a part of the I, Matter of fact, I just talked to him yesterday. You know what I mean? He, he called me. And matter of fact, he said, I said, he said, Coach, thank you because we sent him all that stuff. I sent out to the, the guys that are speaking. And and he called to thank me. And then I started to talk to him. And he says, Coach, can you, you're going to have to help me. I like to put this through a dry run, you know, a few days before the clinic starts to make sure I can get up on you know, get up on the website and get up on the link and, and be able to present it and make sure it all works, the video and the voice and all that stuff. And I said, well, I, I the, the gentleman that that, uh, that I work with doing this is a guy named Keith Grabowski. He says, oh, you mean the guy from Berea? So he knew you. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yep. Said, yeah, he said, I like that guy. Right? So, John... John's really excited about doing it, you know, and in, in the topic, he says, Coach, I really uh, interested topic that you chose. I said, well, John, the guy's going to go, you're interviewing a guy for a job. You're the head football coach in the National Football League. All right, how many guys get the interview, number one? How many guys get a chance to do that? You're already going to interview, 
you know, two, three, four guys, maybe, and you're going to have to choose a guy. Okay, what are you looking for, and what did that guy have that you chose and you wanted him as the offensive line coach? Okay, I think, you know, your ideas and what you look for, I think the younger guys and even the older guys would be very interested in that. That's a, a really uh, something that will help them in their careers. You know, so, I, you know, that's how that all started. And so he, he's really... You know, he's really excited about doing it. Yeah, I'll have to give him a call, make sure he's all set up. Definitely have enjoyed getting to to know him. I I recruited his son to go to Baldwin Wallace when I was coaching there and had the opportunity while I was in Tampa to sit down at his his, uh, Fire Football Coaches Association, (laughs) his little uh, office he had there, and watch watch some stuff with him and just an incredible guy. And then he came in. I think, you know, before our recruiting day at around four or five in the morning, we all sat down and talked a little ball with him as well. So uh, definitely will be a treat to have him here at the Cool Clinic. I know uh, another one that's new is is you wanted to take a look at things from the other side of the ball. And so you uh, have arranged for Mike Waffle, defensive line coach, NFL alum, Aaron Donald's personal defensive line coach still. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about his topic and what he brings to the table for us here at the Cool Clinic. Body mechanics that's needed, okay, the way he teaches defensive line play. Mike Waffle is probably one of the best or the best defensive line coaches that I have ever been around and had the chance to work with. We we worked together at the Raiders, and it was really uh, fun working with Mike because we we had the opportunity in the offseason to sit down and exchange ideas you know, uh, how he's rushing the passer or how he's getting off blocks and, and then how I'm trying to block him. And so we had a chance to exchange what was best for each of us. Hey, it's better if we did it this way or if I did it this way. This is this is tougher on me if you do it this way. You know what I mean? So uh, those were those type of things. But uh, he had coached Aaron Donald. And, and then when he decided to retire, Aaron Donald said, well, would you mind still instructing me, you know what I mean? Even though you're you're not, you know, uh, my coach anymore. And so Mike said, yeah, I'd love to do that. I think what you're going to get from Mike, the different ways that, that he's teaching Aaron. Now, Aaron's a special type of guy, but still, just because it's Aaron, Mike go teach all his guys, you know, you know how to, how to do it or try to do what Aaron does. So you're going to get that from him. And if you're an offensive line coach, you know, you would probably want to take good stock in what he's telling you. You know what I mean? Because you're going to have to block it. You better learn about what they're trying to do to you so you can combat it. I think that is really helpful if you're an offensive line coach. You know, And I really don't care what level you are. Just learn what he's teaching the defensive guy. That will make you a better offensive line coach. You know, and Mike's a wonderful teacher. You're gonna, he, he's not going to make it uh, like a rocket scientist. It's not going to be that way. you be able to understand how he's teaching it, why he's teaching it, and what it looks like when he gets it done. We always talk about the offensive line coaches, certainly in protection, but you know, another kind of coach that really needs to understand protection is the running backs coach. And you've got Kyle Kasky coming to talk about exotic pressure pickup schemes. Again, breaking outside of just the offensive line, Coach Mull, uh, what what was it about uh, bringing in a running backs guy that really thought that you really thought would be uh, a good addition to the Cool Clinic? Well, actually, Kyle, he, he came in to the league as an assistant line coach for Paul Alexander at the Bengals. That's how it started, right? So Kyle came in. And he was doing the, the computer work, and he was helping Paul with the offensive line at the Bengals. So he, he came in as a line coach. And then I was trying to, trying to figure out the mechanics of how it all worked. I think Hugh Jackson then took over the coordinator's job. Hugh Jackson was coaching the running backs, but then he just wanted to be the coordinator at the Bengals. So they needed a guy to coach the running backs. So they went to Kyle. Right, and they asked Kyle, right? They moved Kyle to coach the running backs. So, but he actually started as a offensive line coach. 
he has the running back. I don't know because he coached the running back for a few years at the Bengals. And then when that staff got let go, I think he got on, I'm pretty sure, at least one year anyway, uh, with the Jaguars. And he was doing uh, the special, he's like a special consultant or a special coach where he would do all the protections, all the exotic different protections. And then what they, the problems that they posed to the offense and then how they needed to pick them up. So I said, hey, that would be a good thing that the line guy, that everybody should know that. So in, if you're dealing with protections, right, the defensive guys are pretty innovative. They're going to come up with a lot of different things that you need to pick up. And so this will be very helpful, you know, for the guys that some of these exotic blitzes that they come up with and what you need to do and what how you need to make the adjustments to get it picked up. I think that would be very good for offensive line coaches. Offer everybody in a role. doesn't matter. You also have mindset coach and sports attorney Craig Doman uh, coming in to talk about what is a pro mindset, the mindset that separates the gold jackets from the rest. Talk to us a little bit about uh, Craig and what he's going to bring to the clinic. Craig is not only a, a, an agent, you know, a sport attorney, all right? He, he's also a, a high school football coach. He coaches high school football in Colorado Springs. And, you know, so he, he his son – who was a strong safety for Nebraska. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know if he got drafted or if he signed as a free agent. Okay, in, in, in the last last week, sometimes he's really into the football part of it. Okay, but he's really into the mindset. The guys that think differently. What makes them think differently? Why do they think differently? What happens after a bad play? How do they? You know what? What is their how do, what do they process after they have something bad happen to them on the field to overcome it and keep on going to the next play? And so he's big on how you're thinking as you're playing and things that don't go right and you, you have to make adjustments and how do you make the adjustments and how does your mind work to get this done? And a lot of times it, it, it's when the, the bad plays happen, you know, how do you overcome or how are you how do you prepare, you know, what, what's your process, your thinking process of preparing for some of the best players that you need to play against? So I think that is helpful to some of the coaches, all right, or a lot of the coaches. And he, he's, he's really good at it. He, he works at that part of the game. I, I thought that would be interesting for everybody to listen to Greg. Now, you're bringing in another player, a guy who – probably will be wearing a gold jacket in the not-too-distant future, Willie Anderson. He's going to be talking about the evolution of pass protection. Yeah, Willie Anderson was really unique. I had the pleasure of coaching Willie when I was at the Bengals. I was coaching the tight ends at the time, but I had to go down with the tackles a lot. So it was always Willie and the tight ends, and, and it was really fun coaching him. Charles Haley, Kevin Green, Richard Dent, Bruce Smith, Jared Allen, Terrell Suggs, the list is long and distinguished of guys that have played against Willie Anderson that didn't get a sack. Chris Dolman is another one. He, they, they did not get a sack on Willie. I mean, that in itself should put him in the Hall of Fame. That right there. He's going to bring a perspective in how he sees the game as a player and how he, but some of the greatest pass rush guys that have ever played the game did not get a sack against Willie Anderson. I think that would be really interesting. And any of the little details that he has in his past sets or where he placed his hands or where he's looking with his eyes or did he kind of cheat on a snap count or anything that he needed to get those guys blocked. I think that's very interesting information that you would like to know from Willie. And then running down the, the rest of the guys and their topics, we mentioned Kevin Carberry from the world champion Los Angeles Rams. We'll be talking about fundamentals and running the gap schemes. Andy Heck, offensive line coach for the Kansas City Chiefs, teaching and drilling pass pro three, five, seven step drops. We have Joe Philbin, offensive line coach for the Dallas Cowboys, five man empty protection. Brent Davis, offensive coordinator, offensive line coach for Army West Point, talking about integrating conventional run concepts and techniques into an option offense. I know a lot of the game 
even uh, for non-option teams, has a lot of option elements in it now, so that'll be interesting. Ron Crook, who was the offensive line coach for the Cincinnati Bearcats in uh, last year's Final Four, talking about inside zone fundamentals. Matt Luke, who is the offensive line coach for national champion Georgia Bulldogs, talking about grouping your schemes and how to simplify your teaching. Uh, got a good young coach in Cody Kennedy, offensive line coach for Arkansas, talking about gap scheme combos and GT counter to a three-man surface. We also have Marty Costello, CFL Great Cup champion, talking about techniques and adjustments in the zone running game. And then we have the usual suspects, starting with PFF Pro Football Focus, Steve Palazzolo, talking about using analytics and developing the offensive line. I have to say, Coach, didn't know what to expect from, uh, from PFF in, in that talk last year, but really some incredible insight into the game, into certain aspects of the game, even into analytics behind coaching. So I know there's a ton of takeaways uh, maybe not in the traditional sense of what you're thinking with technique, but things that will really make you think about the game with pro football focus. I always enjoy talking to Steve because the, his view and what they see and how they see it is really quite unique. And it really makes you think as an offensive line coach, hey, you know, there's, there's something to this. Some guys kind of blow it off. I, I sit and I listen and I said, okay, you know, these, all these aspects, how, what can I take? What can I use this? Where is this going to fit in my teachings? Where is this information going to help me when I'm working with a player or I'm trying to put together an offensive line? You've got two or three different free agents that you're trying to pick from. Now you've got all these information on these guys. How is this going to help me pick that guy that I think fits the system that I need or fits the spot that I'm looking to put him in? I think that's really helpful. And it gives you a completely, like you said earlier, Keith, a completely different insight in how they look at the game. 15, 20 years ago, you, never, you would have never thought of that stuff, ever thought of that kind of stuff. Right. Now it's a big part of the game. You know, most, if not all, the teams use some type of analytics. Okay, Kevin, Kevin Carberry's kind of unique that he goes to the Rams in one year. I think he's only been the line coach there for one season, if I'm not mistaken. They go to the Super Bowl and win it. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin called me, I think it was last August. And I remember it was was a hot summer day on the weekend. And I was out mowing the lawn and saw the call come through um, from Kevin. And Kevin's done some some things uh, with me before when I was at USA Football. And and he said, uh, well, I, I got tested positive for covid and uh, I got a lot of time on my hands. How do I get access to the cool clinic? So Kevin went back through during that time and watched the cool clinic and brushed up on some things. And, hey, you never know. Some of that might have paid off for him in, in that championship run. You know, the other, the other thing about the clinic, Keith, that we, I think sometimes we overlook. A few years ago, there were eight guys drafted in the first round. Eight offensive linemen drafted in the first round. This past year, nine offensive linemen got drafted in the first round. Do you know that all their line coaches come to the line clinic or get online because it's virtual the last couple of years or they buy the DVDs or they get on Coach Tube? Every one of them. So I like to think that the offensive line clinic had just a small part to play where those guys are, giving those line coaches, you know, different ideas and different techniques that they could use with those kids to make the kid a better player. Okay, that may have helped them get drafted. Sometimes we overlook, the, you know, what it does down the road for for one of the players. And I, I think that's kind of unique that you get that many guys, offensive linemen that are drafted in the not guys. I mean, one more guy tended to be almost a third of the first round guys. All right, that's a lot of guys. Well, and I said the the usual suspects, and and that being yourself. Jim McNally and, and Paul Alexander. Paul's going to be talking about blocking mechanics two. Last year, he talked about blocking mechanics one. And Coach McNally will be talking about pass protection, twist pickup, and independent hand punches, and I'm sure a number of other things. I know what was, uh, uh, I think, pretty cool last year. I had to get online with Coach McNally several times to make sure we, you know, he could do this virtual clinic. 
But then the, the day he was up, he called me in the morning and uh, he saw, you know, Herb hand the night before and Herb, Herb went pretty long. And <laughs> you know, Jim did not want to be outdone and asked me, how long can I go? And uh, I said, coach, you know, there's nobody in this room behind you. We set you up. You could go whatever you need. He goes, you know, he gets on and says, boys, we're going all effing day. And, <laughs> and he went for, you know, a little over four hours. Uh, but just uh, a wealth of knowledge. I mean, if you don't pick something up from Coach McNally, you're not paying attention. Right. Now, there's so much stuff that you're going to get. This is the problem. It's not that it's a problem. There's so much stuff that you're going to get. There's always so much stuff that you can use. You have to decipher and pick out what is good for you and how you can use it and how you can be effective with it. Right? That's that's one of the – you get so many ideas, you can't use them all, guys. Right? You, it's nice to have them. Write them down, store them, put them someplace. You know, put them in a library where you can go back and – access it if you need them but there's only so many of them that you're going to use if you if you try to get them all and use them all you're going to mess up the player right you don't want to do that a lot of times i think coaches they try to impress players by showing them the knowledge all the knowledge they have they give they give them too much stuff they really do coaches give their guys too much stuff you know i'm under the assumption that it's what you don't tell them is just as important as what you do tell them because you can really mess the kid up if you give them too much stuff. So what you don't tell them is just as important as what you do tell them. You got you guys that are listening you should write that down. Well, coach, we, we didn't mention what you were going to be speaking about. I know uh, every year you, you come up with a little something last year. It was, what do you tell them between the snap have you picked out or narrowed down what you might be talking about this year? Not, not quite so far. I, I don't know. You know, I uh, I put more guys on than we had last year, so I might have had to back off a little bit on this this year. But I'll come up with some some bits of information that hopefully that they can use. But the one that I gave last year, what the you know, what do you tell them when the ball is dead? You know what I mean? I I never been to a clinic where somebody spoke on that ever since I've been going to clinics and as a junior high school football coach, you know, and, and, uh, you know, from the, when the ball, the, the whistle blows, what happens from that point until the ball is snapped, you know, there's a process that that player has to go through. Okay. He just doesn't come back to the auto way for the next play. You know, there's a process and that his mind has to work through the process whether did he win or did he lose? Is he in a growth mindset? Is he in a fixed mindset? You know what I mean? How am I going to, you know, there's a whole process that he goes through to when the ball snapped again. So I'll, I'll come up with something that they'll be able to use. And I don't care what level you're on. doesn't matter. That stuff with the ball is dead. I don't care if you're coaching pop water football. All right. Or if you're coaching the Super Bowl champion, you can use it. Well, the cool clinic will be May 19th through the 21st. And while this is all offensive line, coaches of all offensive line, I say that really this is very useful for every type of coach, every position coach. I mean, this is the nuts and bolts of the game, right? It happens up front. And you're going to learn a ton here that even if you don't coach offensive line, you'll walk away with a greater understanding of the game. So highly recommend it. You can get the ticket at cool2022.coachesclinic.com. Coach, I can could, I could tell you it's, it's been uh, an honor and a pleasure to be able to help you put on this clinic here the last couple years and uh, to be able to get to know you and uh, talk to you frequently, hear your stories, talk about coaching, talk about the game. Uh, it's just been a lot of fun, been been great process here to put this together, and I'm excited about this one coming up here as well. And, and I do appreciate that you give me the gear that the guys get, you know, sending that bag. I got mine last week and, you know, have the uh, the picture up on the wall of all the speakers. So it's, it's just been uh, an honor for me as well, and I'm looking forward to – executing this one for you here May 19th through the 21st. Well, I really appreciate all your help, Keith. It's been really 
fun for me to get to know you and, and your passion that you have for the game, okay? And then all your technical expertise, because I am very poor at that technical expertise stuff, let me tell you. You know, so I'm, I'm probably worse than Jimmy McNally. So, <laughs> so, so getting, getting me up online and ready to go, okay, that's another chore. But anyway, I really appreciate you having me on today. It's been a lot of fun. I hope somebody uh, picked some of the little stuff up, some of the little stories. And, and uh, you know, the, the profession keeps growing. It keeps evolving. And, and it, as a coach, you have to understand that you have to evolve and move along with it. Don't get left behind.